So many people come to me because they want to grow. And in a lot of cases, they can't grow because they don't have the right lead generation strategy. They can't get in front of people. They can't connect with buyers enough. This is going to be a good one for you. David Valentine from Avidel, he came in to share exactly what he has done. And this guy has built eight companies extremely successfully. And he has seen amazing results, primarily through outbound, cold outbound, and networking, connecting, and helping others understand how they can grow. You're going to love this. He shares some exact tips and tactics so that you can grow too. Enjoy. Welcome to Sastery in the Making, the podcast that features the people who made the software world what it is today and the leaders who are shaping the future of technology. Here's your host, Matt Wallach. And welcome to Sastery in the Making. I am your host, Matt Wallach. Super glad to have you here. Thank you very much for coming. If you're on YouTube, thank you for watching. If you are on the podcast, thank you for listening. Very, very excited for this one. Now, I am with a guy who has been on many, many podcasts. In fact, he just told me he does three to four shows a week. So now I'm a little nervous, hoping that he likes our show because he's got a lot, we've got a lot of competition out there. But I'm here with Dave Valentine. Dave, welcome to the show. Oh, Matt, thanks for having me, brother. Super excited to be here. Absolutely. I'm so glad to have you here. Let me make sure I tell everybody about you. So Dave's CEO at Avidel. And Avidel, they book meetings with your ideal clients to quickly scale your business. In fact, David owns several businesses, including a couple of SaaS products. So he's like a lot of us. And he's worked with Fortune 100 companies like Target, Time Magazine, and American Express over the past 16 years. And he has earned them so much money based on what he's been able to do and employ. You're going to really like some of the strategies he's sharing here. So once again, Dave, thank you for coming on the show. Oh man, this is going to be fun. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Perfect. So tell me, what have you been up to lately and what's coming up for you? Yeah. So this year we had a, a pretty exponential growth in all of the companies in revenue and profit. We also purchased or started four new companies this year. So we wow. we doubled our, our brands in the portfolio from four to eight this year. And it's been it's been a busy year. We I actually just got back this past week, Matt, from a retreat in Oceanside, California with Beautiful. the leaders of four of our brands. Had a fantastic time. And uh, I'm excited to get back into the thick of, of work as we push towards 2023. I love that. I bet that was a good time. That's always a fun time to get together the leaders, the teams, and kind of do some. You know, when I do that and I do these retreats, I do some work. Of course, you put together some meetings where you're strategizing, you're looking towards the next year, but also typically there's a lot of fun involved with it too. I bet there was. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Fantastic. So I want to go back. How did you come up with Avidel? It seems like you guys are doing great stuff. How did you get that idea? Yeah. So in my first agency that I started, 10 years ago now, I really didn't know what I was doing, right? I'd done marketing in-house for companies and I was, uh, this is going to date myself, but I was running MySpace and Friends, Friendster pages and I was building websites 1.0 and shooting video and doing video production. And I really was kind of this catch-all person. It, it was funny the other day, Matt, I was telling a junior staff member at one of the companies about how you used to have to text in your tweets and they were like, wait, what do you mean? <laughs> Which was a great moment and made me feel very old. And so I, uh, anyways, I, I'd always been doing stuff in-house. And so then I finally got to this point where I was like, hey, I'm going to go do my own thing. I launched. And like everybody, I kept trying to network my way to sales which is what most people do when you have a high ticket item. It's like, okay, well, how can I make friends with this person? It's going to refer me to that person. And I was really good at it. I, I networked my way to a million dollar business after four years of being around. And right about that time, my doctor said, uh, I went to the doc, I was 29 and uh, he wanted to do a stress test and do like a, a basic physical, which I hadn't done since I was probably 18. So I was like, sure, doc, I'm getting close to 30. Let's do that. And he came back, you know, I came back a week later and the doc's like, hey, we've tested 4,500 people. You're the most stressed out person we've ever tested. Ooh. If you don't change your work and your life, you're not going to see 40. So I was like, well, damn, okay. <laughs> so I had to start to explore how do I do business in a new way? How, I, how do I do business development in a new way? I hired some outsourced 
sales development rep agencies, outsourced SDR firms, some outsourced BDR firms. And they really couldn't get any results until I started writing the email copy for them. And then all of a sudden, they would see a huge spike in meetings booked for me. And I went, well, why am I paying these people? <laughs> if I'm going to be doing their job, what am I doing? And I met a good friend uh, in Fort Worth who had this really small startup, but it was really cool to me. He was sending pinatas in the mail out that came outside of a box. Hmm. And I just went, man, what a fun idea. What if I sent these emails and then sent something creative like a pinata in the mail as a follow-up? What ended up transpiring was huge explosion of growth in the agency, huge change in like what my lifestyle was like, and ultimately ended up selling that agency and starting Avidel because uh, it was a nice niche in the non-compete uh, was to nice. do outsourced SDR services. And the name Avidel is actually taking two letters from each of my three kiddos names. And so it's a really unique name because I want it to be a legacy for my family. And that's really the, the aim and the goal there. So anyways, long story short, that's kind of how I got started with Avidel was no one else was doing SDR as well as we could. And I thought, man, if I can do this really well, this could be a very lucrative business. And it has been. I love it. That's fantastic. I, I, I So much to take away from that. First of all, the naming. I have spent hours naming companies. And there's one company that kind of got notorious within our industry that the company name came from the three founders. We locked ourselves in a room with a bottle of bourbon and a whiteboard. <laughs> as well as a, a URL finder tool and went nuts for five hours and went through most of that bottle and finally landed on our name. So there's a lot of ways to do it. I love the kid thing. In fact, two of my businesses are named after my kids. I have two kids and one of them has the first half of their name and the second half of the other kid. And the other one has the first half of the other kid and the second half of the other kid. So it, uh, it's kind of a fun way to do it. But yeah, uh, what a cool story. Amazing that at 29, you were that stressed out. <laughs> what are what are some of the things you did to kind of de-stress? Because I'm sure a lot of people out there running businesses, they're feeling kind of the same thing. What, what did you do, Dave, to make that happen? Yeah, that was a long journey. That wasn't a, a one-time thing. One of the things that I realized at 29, growing up, I was always an athlete. I was a multi-sport athlete. I lifted weights all the time. And then the thing happened that happens to most of us, right? I got married. I had some kids. I had my own business. I stopped working out. I stopped meditating. I stopped doing the basic things that I had been doing previously to take care of myself. And so <laughs> I had to start making myself work out. I got back into rock climbing, which was something that I hadn't done since I was in college because it was an easy, accessible way for me to compete against myself and also relieve some stress, I started meditating again. Hmm. It took a long time for me to get back into weightlifting, but I did, and I really enjoyed it. I, as I, I was going to therapy, as you do, you know, and I also eventually stopped going to therapy, and I started engaging with uh, some earth medicines, right? I, I had some psychedelic experiences that were extremely helpful to me in my growth and development, not only as a business owner, but also as a husband, as a dad, as a friend. And through the course of all those things and also finding some really helpful teachers to me, I just have become this like a uh, very Zen person that lives <laughs> in the mountains on a river watching the bald eagles fly by. And it's so funny, Matt, I get comments a lot. They're like, you don't seem like a guy that owns eight businesses. And you seem really chill. And I'm like, yeah, well, it's a lot of work to make it really chill and also a lot of hard knocks. But once you get to the other side, if you will, and you start to have these practices and these habits and you start to change the way that you think about things, it's amazing how much stress and anxiety just rolls off your shoulders and you're like, okay, that's all fine. Everything's cool. <laughs> I love that. In, in, in many cases, I don't feel like I'm one of the more stressed person. I kind of have uh, a big picture of, uh, I guess, uh, an overall life picture in general around business. So I typically don't overstress, but every now and then I get, I get pretty, and 
you you I'm envying you right now. It's so awesome. It sounds it still it just feels like you found such a great kind of work life balance and a, a great perspective. Yeah, I enjoy it, brother. I I think one of the things that became apparent to me right about the uh, man, maybe it was four years ago now. That's crazy. Was that this the whole thing? Everything that I'm up to, it's all about improving the lives of other people. My my employees, their families, my wife, my kids, my family. And when you make the thing about other people, it makes it a lot easier when you realize mm -hmm. it's not about you. The other thing too is, is that I was like, I don't want to miss this life. So when I was 29, I was working 80 hours a week. Mm -hmm. And I had this epiphany again, four years ago, where I was like, you're never going to remember the days that you worked really long. <laughs> At 80, you're not going to go, true. remember that one day where I worked like 18 hours? That was <laughs> nuts. You know, like that's not going to happen. I true. am going to remember throwing the football in the front yard with my son. I am going to mm -hmm. remember tucking my daughters into bed at night. I am going to remember having dates with my wife. Those are things that are going to be significant. And so let's not major on the minors. Let's major on the majors. Oh, that's so good. I love it. Tell me, who is Abadel best for? What types of businesses benefit the most from it? So we work a lot with other agencies, which is really funny. So marketing agencies are, are a great spot for us because they have a high ticket item. They're really big into getting some good acquisitions. SaaS products is our other big one, honestly. You know, the, the two SaaS companies that I own a piece of, they also use Avidel services and they generate a lot of meetings every month just because we're trying to get that high ticket, high volume number coming in. So mm -hmm. we actually have our biggest niche is SaaS products. Mm -hmm. Now they can't be the SaaS products that are like, hey, we're $50 a month and that's the highest sure. tier. They have to have a higher tier. And it ends up working out really great for a lot of SaaS companies because they want those higher ticket, higher value clients and customers. And we're able sure. to get a meeting for them with those people. So those are the two kind of big verticals. And then we have a smattering of other people that we work with as well that is uh, really keeps it fresh and fun. I bet. I bet. You talked earlier about network to sales and that you were really good at that. How do you do that? A lot of our audience might have difficulty with kind of finding partners, getting to that point of... of becoming kind of mutually beneficial and getting sales out of it. What are some of your best tips around that? Never contact a person and want to sell them. If you're going to network your way to sales, mm, contact okay. a person and say, Hey, how can I add you value? One of the things that I love to do on LinkedIn still to this day, I just don't do it as aggressively as I used to. I will reach out to people and say, Hey, is there anyone that you see in my LinkedIn connections that you would like me to connect you with? Wow. And just adding that value ahead of time, you, I mean, Matt, it's amazing how many people are like, oh my gosh, that's, uh, you're not trying to sell me something. Oh, uh, let me go look. And then they come back and they go, yeah, I'd love to connect with Matt. Oh, great. Let me, let me make a connection. I make a connection on LinkedIn and then they go, Hey, how can I help you, Dave? Is there anybody mm -hmm. that you want me to connect you with? Well, matter of fact, yeah. And so one of the things that people get incorrect about networking is they're like, I've got to network with that person and make them buy from me. No, you want to go to their network and say, Hey, mm -hmm. how can I help you? What will end up happening is if you actually make a genuine connection with that person, this is what I love. And you sell to some of their friends that will come back to them. And then they'll come back to you and say, Hey, I know that you've worked with these three friends of mine I kind of am ready to work with you and you end up selling them later down the line anyways. So wow. that's my networking tip. <laughs> I love it. That's a great tip. And I can totally see how that would work. Uh, it's, it's just off the principle of give first, you know, if you're in, in any partnership relationship, I tell my clients this all the time. If you're starting to try into a partnership strategy, you need to give, you're not going to have any partners who are just going to give you a ton of great business without you giving them anything. And you're giving first. And we have a natural reaction to that as humans, that if somebody gives us something, we want to reciprocate. So I love that tip. Yeah. 
It's helpful. So good. <laughs> so good. So let's talk about outbound. You run an SDR team. You're doing yep. some great stuff. You're driving incredible results. A lot of people are struggling with outbound. What are some of the biggest mistakes that, that people are making when they think about outbound or when they implement uh, an outbound strategy? Yeah, number one, they're trying. You have to realize that every medium for outbound is different. So LinkedIn is a fundamentally different animal than email. Email, people just want short, sweet, to the point. Two to six sentences is what we find works best. Here's what I do. Here's a case study in a sentence. Here's an offer. Outrageous offers are what drive all eight of my companies. So all eight of my companies had their best year this year, and it's not even close. Like a lot of them had a two and a half X or higher in their revenue. Wow. The reason why they have that is we create these things that are called outrageous offers. So something that sounds too good to be true, but actually isn't. And it adds more value. A lot of times people come to us and they like, hey, I need to solve a problem. And the problem is a result that they're looking for. So when we create an outrageous offer, what I do is I say, sell a result. That's all that customers and clients want. And then charge more because you're guaranteeing or you're selling a result instead of selling, hey, we've got this really cool software and it does all these things. And we all know, right, Matt, 90% of the software that you buy, you don't use. You only use 10%. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, yep. all right, people don't care about all the bells and whistles. They're fine. You can add them to a funnel and say, hey, we've got this and we've got that and we've got this. And in reality, they just want the results. And so if you set up an email and you say, hey, here's who I am. Here's what I do. Here's a case study a sentence. Here's an offer. Let's get on a call. You're going to have great success. What I see happen a lot is, hey, did you know that your website is blah, blah, blah. And it's a 12 to 20 sentence email and it gets Yuck. deleted every time, right? No mm -hmm. one has time. Too big. If you're doing LinkedIn, it's actually the inverse. So if you're doing a LinkedIn drip series, you want to give value, give value, give value, give value, give value. So... <laughs> We educate people in our outreach on LinkedIn, and it takes until the 11th touch before wow. we actually make an ask. Because what happens on LinkedIn as a platform? You make a connection, and instantly you get an, an automated response. Hey, here's what I do. Would you, would you like me to improve your website? I can help you with your <laughs> SEO, whatever. And it's like, dude, come on. You didn't, you didn't take a look at anything. Instead, what we, we do is we were like, hey, did you know that it... According to HubSpot, we link to the article, you have to have 150 business development calls every month in order to make sure that you're going to hit your sales goal at a 93% clip. And people are like, oh man, that's really interesting. Thanks for sending the article. Hey, I found this uh, podcast from fill in the blank. I thought it might be relevant to your industry, right? And so all we're doing is adding value, adding value in LinkedIn. So it just depends on what you're doing. For the most part, though, clarity is key. So one of the things that's funny, Matt, is if we have a really high click-through rate for a client, most people would say, oh, that's great. You're sending out emails. They're getting lots of clicks to their website. That's got to be fantastic. We see that as a negative because then it's not clear who we are, what we do, and how we can help them in the mm. email. Mm. And they're having to click to the website to figure out who are these people. What are they up to? So we actually don't want to have a click-through rate above 10%. And that's counterintuitive to most people. Clarity is king. It's what helps you sell more. The clients that see the best results have outrageous offers, and then they have lots of clarity. That's so good. That's an amazing combo. If you put that together, that's definitely going to get some results. So how do you manage all these eight businesses? How do you stay on top of them? How do you make sure? Because I'm sure that there are others out there who are managing a couple. And right now I have two and I can already feel the stress of two different ones. You've got eight. How, how do you make that happen and keep all these balls in the air? You have great leaders in each of those locations. We have, I have partners, business partners in, in a lot of the businesses, not all, but most. And 
I also have people that are on the leadership team of each of those businesses. We run all of our businesses using EOS, the entrepreneurial operating system, which gives us a cadence for meetings and reviews for employees and a whole set of other things. It keeps us on track. It allows us to have a common language. We have the same six core values for each of the companies. I'm actually finishing up my first book, which is on those six core values. I find it interesting that one of the things that happens a lot whenever I talk about the core values that I have with my consulting clients is they're like, hey, can I steal those? Can I borrow those? I'm like, yeah, man, they're, they're not mine. They should be all of ours. So I'm writing a book on those because they, they tend to be really, really helpful. The way that I run it with such ease is we have dashboards, we have measurables, we have markers that I can look at each and every week and just see where, how are the companies doing. And that's a product of EOS, mm -hmm. really being able to say, okay, this company is doing well, this company is not doing well. The secret sauce that I've found, that is when a company is doing really well, that's when I need to go step in and spend a lot more time on it. When a company is struggling, it's amazing. If you have great leaders, they'll actually figure it out. It's when they're doing really well and they think, oh, this is just going to keep going up and to the right. Mm -hmm. that's when you actually need to step in as the leader that has some seasoning and go, hey, actually, we're about to have some issues. Let's look at this together. That's been a, a thing that I've learned over the past 18 months uh, in spades is that, man, it's really when the company is doing well, when it's soaring, when it's hitting new heights, that's when it needs lots of love and attention. It's not when they're struggling. Well, I can absolutely see that for a couple of reasons. One, it's a tendency to let your foot off the gas. And kind of realize, hey, we've made it. We're there. We're doing this. And I see that a lot. Some of my clients in the software space who are the furthest behind and doing things the wrongest, not a good word, but the wrongest, <laughs> are the big ones. And yeah. they've got so many mistakes that they're making. It's just like, how did you get to this point? Well, they weren't making them before. But now with a bigger team and with more things right. happening and just the process falls apart. And it's amazing. So when you get some success, you start to kind of, let off a little bit early days you're grinding right yeah it's different well, i also think it's different too matt because i've grown so many businesses now at different clips and gotten them to different sizes there's also a difference in leadership needs so you can have a leader at a team of 10 who really tops out at a team of 25 mm -hmm. and and they either need to up level or they need to be demoted they need to be True. down further on the org chart because they don't have the capacity. They don't have the ability to actually manage that many people. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, you could have somebody that gets up to 25 and they actually get better. I've seen this too. It's really, really interesting. These are the people that are like, oh, I can delegate really easily. And if you get me into the space where all I do is whiteboard and all I do is problem solve at a strategic high level, I'm really good. So mm -hmm. I, I've had some, some employees that were like, I was like, I don't know if they're going to make it at 20. And then when we get to 35 and we actually give them a promotion that's more in their wheelhouse, they excel. And so mm -hmm. it goes to that whole thing of like, there aren't necessarily good or bad employees. It's just good or bad timing yeah, for that specific. Yeah, for that specific yeah. employee. And sometimes all you got to do is grow a little bit or shrink a little bit. And it's going to be the right size. It's Just get them in the right seat. Yeah. At the right time. Yeah, I love it. So wrapping up, what advice would you have for other softwares who are just kind of, or other software founders who are just kind of starting out, starting to get their company rolling, starting to grow? What advice do you have for them, Dave? A lot of software founders want to perfect the product. And you're never going to have it perfect. So what does it look like to get it 80% of the way there and then market the crap out of it? I mean, really market and sell this thing. It's amazing what I see in the SaaS founder world. I'm part of a few Saster minds. And one of the things that comes up over and over and over again is, how do I scale this thing? How do I grow it? If you create an outrageous offer, if you sell on results, you will grow quickly. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of, is it good enough? Not, is it perfect? And if it's good enough, 
then the new revenue should give you re the ability to hire more staff to be able to build it out more fully. So that's what I'd say. T tune up the, uh, the marketing and the sales. Fill in for talent on the back end. You'll be able to pay them more because you'll have more cash and you'll create an increasingly better product. I love it. Couldn't have said it better myself. I have a lot of people come to me who say, Matt, we want to use you, but the product's not there yet. We're still working on perfecting the product. And I say the same thing. I say, it's not about the product. It's about how you can get yourself out there and how you can market and sell. So excellent, excellent job here, Dave. Really love this. There's a ton of nuggets for everybody there. Hope you guys heard that. If you didn't, make sure you go back and re-listen to it. Dave, how can our audience learn more about you and Abadel? Yeah. So what I'd love to do, Matt, actually, is I'd love to offer your audience a freebie if, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So uh, what I'd love to do is anyone that's listening to this, if you need some leads generated and you're like, hey, I would love to have some meetings booked on my calendar, hit me up, david at avadel, A-V-A-D-E-L dot agency. And just mention the name of this podcast in the email headline and I will have my team hook you up with three B2B meetings booked on your calendar, no strings attached. Wow. And that's just a, a great way to go there. If you're wanting to follow me for content, I am super active on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok. Uh, you can find me at RealDVAL, R-E-A-L-D-V-A-L. And uh, yeah, you guys can reach out to me there. So I love it. And that's super awesome you to offer that. That's great. Definitely take him up on that, guys. That is fantastic. This has been wonderful, Dave. I really appreciate you coming in, sharing all this stuff with us. Thanks for coming on the show. Oh, great chat, Matt. I loved it, man. Thanks so much. Likewise. And everybody else out there, thank you for coming. Great having you here. If you're watching, make sure that you subscribe. Make sure that you hit that button so you can get all these insights from other leaders and amazing innovators like Dave that we're not going to miss out on anything. But thanks for coming. We'll see you next time. Take care.